afternoon, everyone. And welcome to a nice, sunny, lovely weather of a Saturday day. Let me start with my introduction. My name is Arpita Saxena, and I've been in the field of education for the past 18 years, have taught in schools in India and abroad. And now finally, hopefully, I've settled back in India. Uh, thank you so much, Hello Kids, for inviting me today for a session to share my experiences. I will not be right in saying I am an expert in this field, but yes, uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share uh, what I've experienced and what I've learned in this journey with regards to playful learning. So let's start. Parents and teachers, I hope by the end of the session, there'll be something for you to take away. So let's start the session by saying, um, asking you all something. What do you think is learning? Now, let me tell you something. It's a very, very, very Googleable question. So if you were to type in on a Google, you'll get the answer immediately. And what the answer Google says is it's a uh, you know, it's a process of acquiring new understanding, knowledge, developing skills, attitudes, and behavior. So that's about learning. Next question. Let's come and understand what do you think is play? So play takes different form for different children, and hence there can be no one aspect of definition for play. But however, in short, if I were to generalize play, what it means to me as an educator is it provides opportunities for students to develop their uh, physical and their social uh, well-being. It gives wings to the imagination and it arouses career curiosity and it promotes creativity among students. So we've got learning and now we've got play. So we've defined them. How about what do you think can possibly happen if we were to merge these two concepts together? learning and play. If we were to merge them together, what do you think is going to happen? The children are going to have a blast. The children are going to value what you talk to them. They're going to take you as somebody who, who understands them, who understands fun. They're going to not treat you as adults, but they're going to treat you as collaborators. And hence, children are going to feel more energized, for them, it's not the whole mundane of sitting in a place and learning concept. It's going to be just fun time without realizing that they are learning in this process. So playful learning, honestly, teachers and parents, is a win-win situation for both an educator and for the students. The idea of this session this afternoon is to reflect upon on how to create and nurture a culture of this playful learning in school and at home. So that's it. I hope by the end of these 15 minutes, there'll be something for each one of you to take away. So, you know, the moment we say that uh, play helps in the physical activities and the emotional development, if one word, if you ask me as an educator, I would say, if you ask me one word for play, I would say play is exploration. Play is all about looking at new things, experiment with new things, in short, it's about trying things. A lot can be learned by providing an environment which facilitates this exploration, which facilitates the concept of go ahead, try, see, learn from the things, rather than having a teacher in the front row explaining things to them. If you're talking about exploration and providing opportunities where they can try things, we cannot negate with the fact that environment plays a major role in facilitating playful learning. I won't be wrong to say that your environment is your third teacher. Your first teacher being the parents. The second teacher is, of course, the educator in the school system. And yes, the environment plays a third teacher. So teacher, right now, what I'm going to talk to you for another five, seven minutes, it focuses on what you need to do in your classroom to make sure that environment that you have is very efficient and is very, very effective. Let me first exact, start with an example. So there was a teacher in a grade in a primary section and uh, she, was, she was talking about universe and she wanted to convey an idea of uh, why do you think people go in the space in the first place. And that's how she wanted to, you know, that acted like a provoke. She wanted to make that thing act like a provocation into discussion as to why people travel to space. So instead of just standing there and giving a lecture method, what she did was 
She entered a class in the morning. She had a tray. She covered her tray with a cloth. She stepped in and she pretended like it's very heavy. She opened it slightly and she closed it back again. And all this while she was smiling. The students became curious and they started talking to her. Miss, what do you think is in the, in the basket that you're carrying? She looks at them and she says, um, well, there's something very personal and I'm not telling you. And please, nobody is to go near that tray. And with that, she walks up to the end of the class and she places a tray at the end of the class. The students are now looking. And what she also did is periodically, she used to go walk up to that basket, peep, take off the cloth, peep inside, breathe heavily, and then come back in the class. This went around the whole day. By the end of the session, by the end of the school day, the students were like, ma'am, curiosity is killing us. You've got to tell us. I won't be able to sleep back home. I'll be so restless back home. You've got to share what is in that basket. And then she got that basket in front of the class. She removed the cloth and she said, here it is. It's nothing, it's empty. Of course, the students were disappointed. But what she established was the fact that, see, curiosity got the best of you. And it is this attribute of human being that made them actually travel to the sky and beyond it to know what's there. So hence the whole idea, you know, instead of the lecture method, she started talking about it and established that. So teacher, something for you. Make sure when you step in your class next time, of course, it's COVID now, but think about your class environment. Is your class environment inviting? Is it warm enough? Is it bright enough? Are the colors that are used in a classroom assimilating or too stimulating? Have a think about all of that. Use artifacts to talk about and initiate discussions. Use pictures. Use a lot of your personal experiences, you know, from your travel, from the past, when you were growing up. Have some kind of pictures in a classroom because those are going to be your uh, conversation starters. That's going to get them to think. What do you think the artifact is? What is the purpose of it? Who got it? Why did the teacher bring it? You know, it's just digging it into the curiosity. Moving up next is setting up of the classrooms. What is very essential, teachers, is when you're setting up your classroom, of course, you A, cater to the different levels of the students. Make sure there is flexible seating around in your classroom. A child, it's trainable. Trust me, as I'm aging, I realize one thing to sit in one place and start working. No, probably no. So if I worked in one particular place in one particular position, probably getting up and moving to another position kind of helps me think better. So have some kind of a flexible seating in a class which allows students, I'm not saying to slouch, but it gives them that comfort level that this, there is an option where they can go sit and learn. Spaces, again, the materials that you use in a classroom, are they kept in a place where the child has to actually go take permission and then use it? Or have you kept it in a very comfortable position that the child feels free to walk up to that material and take it and interact with it? Both the ways, the child is going to get the material. However, in the former place, the child has to ask. However, in the latter case, the child becomes independent. So what you're doing is you're actually getting the child to become more independent. He's not waiting for instructions from the teacher. He's actually saying, OK, this is a material I need to deal with. This is what I want. Let me bring it up. Let me interact with this. Like I said, artifacts are very good for provocation. Another thing is be mindful of the materials that you're providing in your classroom always have some space dedicated space for something like for light and shadow children love that something for a role play something for an art corner something for them to try with science corners as well if you're one of those who have ocd issues too bad deal with it okay get something you develop a new attitude but please remember in your classroom for playful learning, ensure that there is a space which facilitates messy play as well. And that becomes very important. Back at home, teach, uh, you know, with parents and the teachers there, it's like use nature. It's there in abundance. It's all around us. So let students interact with the nature. 
you can't go out. That's perfectly fa fair enough. But what you can do is you can bring in twigs, you can bring in branches, you can bring in flowers, you can bring in those leaves out there. Get them to smell, feel, touch. Because that's equally important. It's playtime for them. However, what they're doing is they're learning about texture. They're learning about taste. They're learning about smell. Let me give you another example. So that just to reiterate what I'm saying. So there was a school, and of course I can't say this is them, I can't name the school because of this privacy and security reasons. But what the teacher, but trust me, this is a school in India we're talking about. So what the teacher does is she took the students out in the playground and she there were trees around and there were you know shrubs and things and she just let the students play about it. They played and they played and they played and somehow the other one of these students hit upon some seeds out there. He got it to his friend and that's where the conversation started. Is it trees would give seeds or does the tree come from the seeds? He said, oh look, I found the baby of the tree and he just protruded his hand to show the seeds which were there. That gave an idea to the teacher which said, okay, fine. She says, okay, since even I don't know, don't be ready with your answer. Don't be the Google or don't be the Wikipedia. Let's experiment, teachers. That's the one thing as the educator I've said. And of course, with experience and with age, it has come to me that why am I standing there and claiming to know it all? I'm not an encyclopedia. I don't claim to be. And fair enough. Let me learn with the students. It's OK for educators to step up and say, um, I'm not sure about that. But you know what? What I'm sure is, let's find out a way to find out. That's what I'm sure about. So let's collaborate and find out. So what this teacher in this case also did was she took the students in the classroom. She got some seeds and she planted the seeds in the soil. Of course, there was a whole uh, you know, conversation about what is that it needs to be nurtured? What do we need to do to ensure that it's been properly taken care of? And then, of course, from the seeds came the plant. It was playful and yet it was not a wastage of time. What she also did was carefully planted those seeds somewhere there for students to discover, explore, and talk about it. Another interaction with the nature teachers is, you know, uh, there's another school, of course, in India. And all these cases, I'm not fabricating. Trust me on it. These are something which, during my travels and interacting with educators and schools, have come across these examples, which I thought it's always worth sharing it with the education um, community. Another example is, is when this teacher got the students outside, and this is a different school and different set of teachers we're talking about. So she got her students out there in the open area and she let them play. You know, you're thinking, your creativity needs space and time. You can't sit in a bench and say, okay, here, bang, the question, now answer, be creative. No, that ain't happening. So you give them the platform and give them that environment so that it initiates and get them to start thinking on those lines. So coming back to this example of this tree and, you know, she got this and this is we're talking about four or five years old. So she got them playing around a tree and all of a sudden, you know, what happened was uh, the student said, you know, if you have to ever find out because they were doing something with uh, standard, non-standard uh, tools of measurement. And they said, OK, if you had to find out how big is a tree, what's the best way to do it? And then, of course, someone from the group suggested, all right, let's join hands together. And then let's measure it. So what they did was they ensured that they're joining hands around the tree. But then they realized that the moment they break their hands, they will never know because they will not be able to form the same circle. So they thought and thought and thought and thought and thought. And all this while, the teacher was only focusing on the kind of conversations that was that this part was generating. It was actually a tap into not what the student is thinking, but also on how they are thinking. So eventually what they did was they said, fine. So went up to the teacher and said, can we have some kind of a thread, a rope or anything? So they got some kind of jute rope. They circled it around the tree. They marked the end position. They got that straight rope and again they circled it. And then they said, if they have to find out about a width or how big is a tree, that's one way to do it. Did learning happen? Oh, absolutely, yes. They understood the whole concept of non-standard measurement with just one activity without the teacher banging her head and making them do page number seven from one to five sums. 
So let's look at another perspective. It's like, how do we, so this is the environment, one aspect which we have to carefully plan to facilitate playful learning. What are the other ways? You know, it's like, always remember, it's talk, talk, talk. You're an educator, you're a parent, teacher, parent, whatever you are, the idea is talk and talk. Encourage multiple perspectives. Now, bringing in this encouraging uh, multiple uh, perspective, let me give you another example. How do we go about encouraging multiple perspectives? So I'm sure most of us have heard the story, Red Riding Hood, and we are led to believe that there is, in that story, the wolf was the big bad wolf. And all through our growing up years, we've always believed that the wolf in that Red Riding Hood story is a big bad one. Now let's pause and let's start looking at from the other perspective. Is he really the bad one? Why? He only did what he was supposed to do. That's his food eating. That he, I mean, he was hunting for his food. So when he saw Red Riding Hood, it actually didn't look like Red Riding Hood. For him, it was his food. He must have been hungry that day. Red Riding on the other hand side, the Red Riding Hood. She was being clearly instructed by her mother not to stop on the way not to talk to strangers, and yet she decided to disobey. But all this while, we are assuming that the Red Riding Hood is a protagonist and the Big Bad Wolf is the antagonist. So start talking. It's like, you know, it's like stepping into their shoes. Encourage your perspectives. When you narrate a story to your uh, children, Always stop and say, so let's, this is this, what the, the book is, the narrator is talking about this character in this way. But do you actually agree with it or do you not agree with it? Similarly, you know, teaching a concept of like herbivores and uh, carnivores. We always have a story like the big, uh, you know, the boy who cried wolf. Pose a question to your uh, students and ask for a uh, perspective and saying, you know why? The boy cried wo uh, wolf, 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 wolf. And it was a big deal. But what about instead of the wolf, if there was a camel coming, walking towards the cattle? Do you think the boy would have got as scared as he was? He would be in case of wolf. If yes, why? If not, why? And that would actually lead to the understanding of, you know, carnivores and herbivores and things like this. Again, enhance creativity. If you have to enhance creativity, what does play, how does play help with your enhancing creativity? What you can do is actually start breaking the rule of established pattern in order to, you know, look at things different way. Giving you an example of this, what mostly happens is, you know, um, the teachers at the beginning of the class set up the class, the students walking, they have been instructed, this is how you receive the class and this is what you're going to do when you leave the class at the end of the day. Have you ever considered using students as collaborators and saying, all right, this class is not my class. This is our class. It belongs to all of us. And hence, as an adult, it's just not my responsibility to place the, uh, the furniture in the class or be bothered about the layout of the class or plan the layout of the class. It's something that has to be co-constructed. It's something that we need to have students and the teachers work as collaborators and decide on what do you think the layout are going to be classroom look like? Involve students in planning. Yes, there is a pre-planning. Teachers invest a lot of time, a lot of efforts in pre-planning. And educators, let me tell you, I'm not saying don't plan. There is a, uh, you, there is a need for pre-planning. However, in your curriculum and in your daily activities, keep that little scope, keep that little window of not planning for the child, but planning with the child. Because then the moment you do this, it becomes, it becomes their ownership because you have given them the opportunities to voice what they want. You've given them a choice to state, will this be or rather this? For the moment, you know, they make these small little dis uh, decisions. It's fun for them to play around in the classroom in terms of what goes on the boards, what has to be there, what the classroom has to look like, how has the furniture to be placed. The moment they start doing this, you know what? Even without you losing your control, 
you'll realize that because they'll have a voice and a choice, they'll also have an ownership in taking care of the way the classroom being set up. It might take a while to get to this part. But yes, because of this, in a very, very playful way, what you have told them, what you have made them understood is a sense of decision making. When, of course, they're interacting with their, uh, you know, friends and their peers, they will be bound to be disagreement. But what you've taught them is to the art of negotiation, the art of collaborating with your peers to make something happen. And of course, yes, there is going to be negotiation of let's do it this way. OK, I don't want to do it. So let's do the, they reach a level of compromise. So in a very playful way, what you've taught is you've taught the skills for life for these students. In your classroom also, a good idea would be to start creating metaphor along with your students. So let's say, for example, you can have, when it's come down to your outdoor play, call it some kind of, you know, Einstein studio, because that gets you start thinking. Call something like a cave, where, you know, you give time for students for self-reflection. All right, let's set up the cave and time for self-reflection. You can talk about the mountaintop. And the mountain top would actually mean right when it's time for students to start making the presentation. What you're doing is you just with the old thing, you're giving it a new name. It's just a metaphor. But along the way, what you're also doing is you are using students to do that. Again, I'm a big fan of something which is like a lateral thinking. So, you know, the convergent thinking and divergent thinking for that matter. And trust me, uh, everybody, I'm a huge, huge fan of this. It's so, you know, instead of just giving a problem and achieving a solution for it, let's create problems and invite different opinions and different ways in which you solve the problem. So let's say for an example, I know and I've, I've done this in my class, I'm very aware of this part. Um, I just threw a question, of course, they were up a um, primary, but I just threw the question like, you know, there's a man, he has an umbrella. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't even say that. So it's like there was a man and he lives on the 24th floor. While coming in the morning, he has to go to the office. So while coming back, what he does is he is actually, he comes down from the 24th right to the bottom. However, in the evening, when he has to go back to the upside, what they do is um, he just presses to the 10th, 10th floor and then he walks from it. What could be the possible reason? However, in the rainy, uh, during monsoons, what this person does is he, he goes right in the morning, he comes down, but in the afternoon, in the evening, he goes right from the ground floor to the 24th floor why is it and you know the students thought and thought and thought and thought and they realized they couldn't so they started coming up with different various reasons like uh man because probably he wanted to exercise in the evening after his work was done and then you know just, just and was he are they wrong definitely wrong but the answer that i had in my mind was because he was a dog and his finger couldn't reach up to the 24th floor so when he comes in the morning he's able to press a zero because it's at the bottom however in the evening when he has to go up he doesn't do it. During the rainy seasons, he uses his umbrella to press the 24th button. That's my answer. However, the multiple answers that the students came up with, were they wrong? Definitely not. But what happening is you're pushing them to think out of the box. You're getting them to move out of the comfort level. So it's like promote natural thinking, uh, encourage perspective, give them, help them get the plan together in a classroom. Look at the environment of a classroom. And I say environment is a class out there. Uh, another thing, you know, all of this, teachers, I do understand requires planning. So you just have to think on what is my goal today? What development, what area of students development am I looking at? And then start planning when you're planning your learning engagements. Always keep that scope of where is the scope when I'm giving chance for students to make a choice? Where is the scope where I'm giving a chance for them to voice themselves? Because with the voice and with the choice will come the ownership. And with the ownership, the learning will be fun. 
they'll start viewing you educators as not somebody who comes and speak in the class and just teaches them and goes off in the lecture method. But the here is a person who values play. Don't start looking beyond the level of cuteness. It looks cute and hence I'm doing it. Where are the opportunities for students to think? Start looking at that. Stop asking close-ended questions and start moving towards more of an open-ended question. I have a son, now he's in college, but he was when he was three years old and we were learning abroad. And every day when he used to come back home, I used to ask him, so what did you do today? And his standard answer was, I ate an apple, I wore my jacket, I read a story, went out to play. That's Monday for you. Similarly, what happened was to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then January finished, February finished, and March, I think the mother in me lost the patience. And I said, you know, every day you come back home, you eat, and you tell me you ate an apple, you wore your jacket, you read a book, you went out to play. Can you, for God's sake, change the fruit? Years later, I realized it wasn't him, it was me. I just had to change my strategy of asking questions. I have to be a more open. Who wants to come back at the end of the day and want to recall what happened in the school? I don't want, when I come back from my school, I just want to sit and not be spoken about. And definitely, I don't want anybody asking me how was my school and what did you do? Because I give a sharp and I say, seriously, you want me to recall the day and let you know? And you know what? Just because the student is not saying that doesn't mean he's not feeling it. And hence, change your strategy of asking questions. Rather than close-ended questions to which has a definite answer, let's start moving towards questions which can have different answers. Instead of saying, what did you see in the zoo? Move on to, so what in the zoo? Which part in the zoo did you like the most? Which animal facilitated you? With this, I hope the session has been useful and has been interactive, it's, um, it's not interactive, it's life out there. But I just hope teachers, you were armed with a few strategies and the importance of knowing what is playful learning. Um, are there any questions out here at this point of time that you want me to take? Okay, so here we have, we've got, hi Anand, um, how can teachers create playful environment for learning and how can we encourage them for play-based learning? Um, and then trust me, I am also a workshop leader. So if I go around with Asia Pacific conducting workshops on these aspect and um, it takes three days for me to explain that to educators. But in short, like I say, a playful environment is one where you have scope for children to interact with. And when you say interact with, it's everything. Interact with the teachers. There are opportunities and the materials which are kept are in such a way that it helps them to start thinking. You don't necessarily need Lego toys. I mean, with no offense to Lego, but you don't need expensive toys. Is your environment has uh, materials which facilitate them to start thinking? So simple as a cardboard box, simple utensils, a few dupattas thrown here and there will help them. The most important part of the playful environment is how you design the timetable in your classroom. Because if you are one of those who want to make the students sit in one place and you start lecturing them about it, and you haven't given them the time to explore and interact with the material, trust me, no matter what environment, the best of environment and the best of the school around the world will not help out in that. However, if you've created that time, it becomes, uh, you know, for them to interact, it's good. Another concept, Anand, I'll just, uh, I know I'm running out of time. I'm sure the Hello Kids would be like, what's wrong with her? But I'll just also tell you, there is a concept called as play mapping. You know, just to know what kind of play does students enjoy, what you need to do is actually leave the students for some time. Where, what is the role of the educator at that point of time when you're leaving them is to stand and observe them. What is that one material? What is that one corner that the students keep revisiting? What is that one material that everybody is clamoring to play to? And bam, there it comes. You will get your idea. Instead of you deciding and you Googling on what are the materials and what are the different corners best for the children, what you've done is you've elicited the answers from the students by just observing them, which is that corner, which is that material that they keep coming back to. When you're setting up your corners, use your students as collaborators. All right? So at that point of time, you will get to know, let's design our corners, use them, and that's how your playful environment will be created. 
Thank you so much, Anand. And I just hope that answers your question as well. Is there any other question? If not, thank you so much. It's been an awesome experience. And once again, thank you, Hello Kids, for generating this opportunity. Be safe, all of you. Bye-bye.